Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Dector. I'm the Conference of a Neighborhood Planning Manager for the City of Flagstaff, and I am here to offer this snapshot today on growth. What is it? Why do we care about it? This is the first in a series of two videos covering the topic of growth because it's so central to what the Flagstaff Regional Plan has to address as we develop this next iteration of the document. Um, and also with me today from Coconino County is Melissa Shaw, who is the long range planner um, to discuss some differences between the city and the county's growth patterns. So this is a reminder that this is a series of regional snapshots. There's almost 30 of them and we are maybe about a third of the way through. Um, and so our next two topics are going to be growth 201. So the second iteration of this video. And then on December 13th, we are gonna go more in depth on the regional economy, which we covered in a video earlier in November. So if you didn't get a chance to join us for that snapshot, you can go back and review it. It's on the City of Flagstaff's YouTube channel, or you can access it through our project website at www.flagstaff.az.gov forward slash regional plan 2045. Um, like all of our regional snapshots, these are in draft. They are presentations that are supporting um, our understanding of the region and our ability to share information broadly um, on what we've learned as we are sifting through an enormous amount of data and uncovering um, little nuggets of, of knowledge about what's going on in Flagstaff, and what has been going on for the last few years. So we've broken this series into a 101 and a 201 topic. So today we are going to go over principles of growth, some recent growth in the Flagstaff region, how we could characterize it, and how the city and county have been managing growth in a very high level. Um, at the next webinar, which will be a week from today, <clears throat> on December, uh, sorry, December the 6th, my brain just stopped for a second. Um, we will talk about the distribution of growth in the region, what our growth projections look like, and trends that may influence growth, some within and some outside of our control. Um, we are talking about growth as a specific topic, even though it's many, it's made of many, many different subtopics, because it is central to what a general plan, and this is the city's definition, of course, the county has a similar definition for a comprehensive plan, but a general plan has to include objectives, principles, and standards for local growth and redevelopment. So growth and redevelopment go a little bit hand in hand. Redevelopment is just a type of growth where it replaces something that had existed previously in the community where growth is a much broader topic. But this is an essential part of the definition of a general plan. And so it is really key that we understand it well. And it is something we will talk about throughout the process of updating the regional plan, which is the general plan for the city and a comprehensive plan amendment for the county. So a reminder that the region in this case is made up of the city of Flagstaff and the surrounding areas sort of north to um, Sunset Crater, south to Kachina Village and Mount Nair, west to Camp Navajo and Belmont, and east past Walnut Canyon to the Cosmino area. So this is roughly the area, this square. This is actually the boundary for our metro plan region, which is our transportation region that's used um, to bring federal funding for transportation projects into our region. So how can growth be characterized? If we were doing this psychologically, we could talk about personal growth, but in this case, we're really talking about regional growth specifically. And so we can often characterize this using a couple of different things. We can talk about it in terms of our increase in population and density, which we've talked about in great detail in a previous webinar on population and demographics, the scale and character of new development and redevelopment, the pattern of development, the distribution of social and economic benefits that come from development, and also how growth is influencing the expansion of functions and opportunities because that doesn't happen linearly along with growth. It's not like one additional person always means a specific unit. Sometimes growth because of its pattern and scale can change how the units of different functions and opportunities that government and private, the private sector provide within a region um, has met certain thresholds and it can either add efficiencies or difficulties depending on all of these criteria. So there are some opportunities and challenges that come with growth. Um, it is, we don't really get a choice to be um, Peter Pan. We have to choose a way to grow up. 
as a community. Um, if there's growth, it is it will happen to your community in the United States. And so you either proactively prepare for it or you may have more challenges when you don't, much like when we talk about carbon neutrality or climate change, the same principle applies. We're trying to look ahead and understand how these many different trade-offs and choices that we may have to make as we grow could influence the outcomes in the community. There's a little different flavor to that in the city and the county. So in the city, we have a water resources division and water services, and that division provides water and sewer. That's one of the key differences because that allows the scale and type of growth that can occur in the city of Flagstaff to be very different. So the menu is broader because we have this centralized system and functions. Now we often think about whether we're providing those, those facilities sustainably and economically efficiently, and that is a constant conversation with the city. We also have declared an affordable housing emergency. We have goals around transportation choices. There's equality and inequality issues in the community that we wanna see addressed, or at least thought of carefully as we go through the process, decision-making process about growth. And then there's the preservation of open space, conservation, and habitats. The county, that, made, that, tr that set of things we're looking at in this realm and how they're influencing each other is a tad bit different. Melissa, I wonder if you just take a moment to talk about the county's uh, experience of growth and what opportunities and challenges that presents and should be considered as we work through this conversation. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So um, just to go back to the water resources piece, um, as Sarah mentioned, the city has got a water resources department and they've got a water supply and with that then wastewater treatment. The county doesn't have that unless it's provided by a private provider. So we do have some private water companies that, that provide water such as in Belmont and Doney Park. Um, and then down in Kachina, there's a wastewater treatment plant um, as well. So that's something though, the county is not a water provider and we don't treat wastewater. So that limits and growth to some degree, it puts the burden on the developer to either come up with a private system or the individual homeowner to have a private system. Um, and that does affect the development patterns. Um, so development patterns in the county are different. What we see are more um, generally, not, not 100%, but more large lot development, which leads to a different pattern of land consumption, which affects our open space and habitat. Um, we also have issues with rural character. So, um, you know, growth does affect rural character in a lot of ways and whether it's perceived or whether it's actual change and more modern style of development. Um, so we do look at growth, um, although the county is seeing growth, we do see some of the opportunities and challenges in a slightly, from a slightly different angle. And I think that pretty much covers that slide. Thank you, Melissa. So something to acknowledge right at the beginning is our community is growing. Our region, Flagstaff's region is growing. Um, it's actually growing at a faster rate than the rest of Coconino County. And so that's really critical to understand is that the growth in the Flagstaff region impacts not only those of us who live in this region, but also Coconino County as a whole. The growth in Flagstaff means different services get provided you know, like a retailer or many of these economic development um, opportunities that we go, we have a staff that goes out and tries to find, you know, there's population thresholds often for many of those things. So as we grow, Flagstaff has become, um, and especially over the last 20 years, a bigger percentage of the total population of Coconino County and the region has grown at a somewhat similar rate. Now, the scale and pattern of development is something I think everyone can acknowledge we've seen changes in, in Flagstaff in the last 10 or 15 years. In 2005, um, we definitely were still talking about increasing density and having different scales of housing. Um, we weren't achieving a lot of it. We actually had a large period of time um, where we didn't build anything but single family homes in Flagstaff and the surrounding area. And that has changed and we'll talk a little bit about how, but when we conceptualize what a uh, building looks like and the character and scale of a building, um, we often use this diagram that is often used by the Council for New Urbanism in the planning world. And it talks about single family homes as one style of development. It's probably the one most of us are most familiar with. 
But then there is a suite of other kinds of housing, townhomes, bungalows, condos, that all put together make up this bigger group of housing called a missing middle housing. And then there are mid-rise buildings, which Flagstaff has experienced the first real set of residential mid-rise buildings off campus in the last 10 years in a big way with buildings like the Hub and the Standard and Aspen Place, um, and most recently the Uncommon. So all of those buildings fit that mid-rise category, but there's been a lot of development of these in-between styles too within the city of Flagstaff. Coconino County is still primarily seeing detached single family homes, though there has been some proposals for townhomes and other styles of housing in the last few years as well. Another way we look at growth is this pattern of development. So that's kind of a bird eye view. And what these maps that you're looking at are called is they're called figure and ground drawings. So the white areas are buildings and the black areas are areas that are not a building. So they are a green space or a parking lot or they are a street or some other feature like a river, which you can see in the San Francisco area. There's kind of a drainage that pulls through the city in that direction. And what this lets you look at is the connectivity and the pattern of development and how um, densely uh, patterned the urban spaces are. So Idaho Falls and Buffalo and San Francisco have very distinctive patterns, both in their street grids, the natural features that are part of their landscape and the buildings and their situation and orientation want. Some are very organized, some are moderately organized and some more fit that integrated conservation pattern. So the in the 1990s, really the ideas about how we manage growth started to come into these, this fruition. And there was a clear dichotomy between urban sprawl, which was the typical characterization of um, development from about the 1950s to the 1980s, which was poorly centralized planning, leapfrog development. So there'd be a development and then a big vacant area and then more development on the other side of it. And so there'd be some inefficiencies in how places were sequenced in their development. Um, outward expansion being the primary, um, uh, the primary means of growing a city, which meant there were a lot of annexations during this period and people were growing out rather than growing in, um, which was high on the land consumption side of things. As Melissa said, that's been an issue in Coconino County, that there was low density development. So that made them very auto-oriented and um, very hard to create transit and walkable and bikeable communities. So smart growth principles developed out of this period in the 1990s, and you could kind of combine these with principles of new urbanism, which we'll talk about maybe later on when we get to character and design pieces. Um, but what smart growth principles, and there's lots of different ways you can see them. If you go to the American Planning Association website, which is planning.org and put in smart growth principles, you'll get like a nice 10 page document on what is smart growth. Trying to find a way to produce that in just one little slide, we've kind of reached out to the Vermont Natural Resource Council, which has really great illustrations on the differences between sprawl and a disconnected urban space and a smart growth space. So. Smart growth principles, if we really nail them down to the basics, is that we develop clear boundaries where there's areas appropriate for growth and new development and areas that are not. That doesn't mean no growth happens in those places. It just means we don't promote growth as a community through law, regulations, and structural practices. Now, if you, as a community, um, pick so many places as inappropriate for redevelopment, and for new development, then you can end up with affordability issues because eventually the market is gonna start pushing people out further and further if we're not doing a good job of balancing this decision-making. Another piece is increasing allowable densities within areas designated for growth, um, allowing for maximum infill potential on vacant land and redevelopment opportunities when we have brownfield sites, ensuring that new development is well-designed to create attractive, friendly, pedestrian friendly environments that enhance community character. And what they show on their website where they sort of explain smart growth as a principle is really well connected neighborhoods. You can see this, not that, which is kind of a, a nod to the way the historic preservation rules are written. But you know that main roads and arterials 
have lots of connections and lots of buildings that, that face them and create block structures. People really like these kinds of neighborhoods. They live in town site and south side and they do have issues with um, people driving through the neighborhoods. We have to manage traffic calming when we build neighborhoods like this. But what does not promote smart growth is what planners call the loop and lollipop pattern of having lots of little cul-de-sacs and not ways for neighborhoods to be interconnected. Um, because that decreases the potential of the bicycle and pedestrian environment and the ability for people to choose modes of travel that are not vehicles. Now, likewise, on the natural conservation side, when we are building in this loop and lollipop manner and not in a dense manner, we can end up consuming open spaces that we might want to preserve. So they provide this example of sort of a river through town. Are we preserving a wide swath that allows riparian functionality on the river? Or are we squeezing it in between development um, in a way that maximizes the number of units being built, but not in a way that creates a productive street grid and the other pieces of smart growth that really help us meet some of those other objectives that we were not meeting from the 50s to the 1980s. Now, in the rural Coconino County, there's a slightly different way of approaching it. Obviously, Flagstaff be having the only water system is one of the only places that can support medium to high density up to mid-rise buildings. But Coconino County also um, has some pattern issues um, that are part of their goals in terms of land use. Melissa, would you like to um, explain a little more about integrated conservation design? Sure, and th this slide shows um, a couple of different scenarios. This, the image on the left shows existing undeveloped land and the image on the right really displays uh, very well kind of a um, iconic design for integrated conservation design where we take the idea of you know, what land is you know, really naturally functioning, preserving those lands and grouping the lots away from those so that they're more clustered, they're, they're closer together, they're smaller, but there's the same density. And you can see that smaller image in the middle is the same density, the same number of units, but in a different, more traditional and more typical pattern of design. So integrated conservation design really does look to preserve the natural features and natural systems functioning while creating integrated neighborhoods um, and then providing connections between um, the neighborhoods and, and the houses. So, you know, this is a strategy that the county's comprehensive plan promotes. We've seen a few subdivisions that were designed with, with this um, idea in mind because there is a benefit to the developer in that they are permitted the same density with a lesser footprint. So this is something though, it's a strategy to promote smart growth within the county, the more rural settings. And the regional plan we have currently promotes this as cluster development, um, but integrative conservation design is a much broader topic that um, is really interesting. Thank you, Melissa. So let's get into what our current growth management strategies are in the regional plan. So currently we incorporate a few of these smart growth and conservation design principles. Um, we identify activity centers, which are the the dots and circles on this map. Um, they are areas of mixed use development that focus on multimodal transportation and on building higher density housing and opportunities to have 15 minute neighborhoods. So the concept of a 15 minute neighborhood is that you can walk or bike to work or get on a transit stop or any of those things within 15 minute walk of where you live. Um, and so those, those broader circles are actually defined as pedestrian sheds um, for that purpose in the regional plan. We also delineate areas of open space and we delineate places that should have development versus places that shouldn't. That's one of those key distinctions of proactive smart growth. Um, and we provide a distinction between the rural and the urban and suburban landscapes of the community. So the Brooktanish area on this map is the areas identified for rural development, more like what Melissa was talking about. And the yellow and orange areas are urban and suburban areas, which have that increase in density, more connected neighborhoods, more of those smart growth principles apply. Um, and the Behind this sort of more generalized map was a more specific effort where we actually did scenario planning within these fr this framework 
and incorporated transportation decisions and water capacity projections to ensure that we would have a hundred year water supply and that we could build in the future a transportation system that could actually support this pattern of development. And that is one of those assumptions that we will retest as part of working on the regional plan update. So another key tool in this toolbox that the regional plan provides about growth is we have urban and rural growth boundaries. So if you look on the map, you will see these sort of dashed areas. The one closest to the city right here, the dot dash dot dash is our urban growth boundary. And then the one with sort of a dash and three dots that is out in these communities here is the rural growth boundary. Um, the city of Flagstaff, does not provide water and sewer outside of our urban growth boundary. So you could be within the city of Flagstaff, um, though most private land in the city of Flagstaff is within the urban growth boundary. There's some examples of like some little islands out in the, um, out in the county where that's not the case. Um, and so we, we will provide water and sewer when you build a new subdivision or you provide housing, you have to pay for meters, of course. But in the rural activity centers, your, you can develop in those places, but you um, have to be on a private water system. You have to go through the process of having your septic tank approved. Um, Melissa, would you like to add anything about the rural growth boundaries? Well, they're also intended to be less intense. Um, it's a real, it's a mixed use to serve the local neighborhood. So it really is not, um, you know, some of the more urban activity centers would actually attract other um, types of businesses that would be maybe uh, tourist oriented, but really the, the rural activity centers are focused more on serving those neighborhoods. Correct. Yeah, and, the, and I think that's important to know that these are not some new creation. We have had these growth boundaries based on a numerous utility studies um, and other decision-making since about 2001. And they've changed a little, but they haven't changed a lot. Um, in the city of Flagstaff in particular and in Coconino County, to develop in the manner that you might want to outside of an urban growth boundary, it's very often that you need a plan amendment and the rural growth boundaries. If you're outside of either of those and you're wanting to do some type of development, you could very easily need to do a plan amendment. So that's another procedural hurdle to try and keep the development centralized to where the services um, are available. Now, growth indicators um, in the last 10 years have shown that we've had pretty steady growth um, coming out of the recession in terms of construction permits. Um, there was a lot of catch up to do though, because between 2004 and 2010, there was zero multifamily housing units built in Flagstaff. Even though there was demand for them, the market and the way financing worked at the national level, this is a macroeconomic trend, um, for housing really only funded single family housing projects. And so in many communities like Flagstaff, that led to a real dearth in multifamily. So the supply was stable and the demand was going up. And that is part of why we really saw that flip after the last recession in 2009 and 2010 is because the, the market was correcting and it was a fast correction. So we went from having zero multifamily housing, which is what that MAH means in this table below, to having several hundred a year. Some years we had more multifamily housing units built than we had single family homes built. And so that process back and forth um, of market adjustments is another key part of growth. We don't always control those macroeconomic trends, but we can be prepared for when they shift. Um, so there's really only been three new single family style subdivisions in Flagstaff since 2013, um, which can be can seen as a positive or a negative. If you're looking to have more supply of single family homes, there hasn't been a lot of increase in that area. But we've also been doing a large amount of infill almost at the same pace we were prior to the recession. We've had um, you know, a lot of redevelopment projects, um, which helps meet our carbon neutrality goals. There have been almost 3,000 new dwelling units in the last five years in the city, um, as we have really seen a pickup of this trend. Melissa, do you want to talk a little bit about the character of growth in the last 10 years in the county? Yeah, sure. The, so in the, the county portion within the regional plan, um, has been, and I didn't have the um, numbers up here to show, but has been primarily single family residential. Um, the, Belmont um, has also had a lot of single family residential. However, there's also been some recent townhouse development 
And that image on the lower right shows one of our newer developments under construction right now. And those are townhouse style developments. And the aerial image above just shows some of the denser um, type of uh, development that's occurring in Belmont. So um, that these subdivisions in Belmont have added a lot of new units of housing to the regional supply. We've also had subdivision growth in Donny Park, Timberline, Fernwood. That has been primarily single family. It's all been single family development um, of one acre or larger parcels. And then um, I think Sarah has an additional bullet on the bottom of this slide. So yeah, primarily in the county, um, it's single family style, large lot development, Belmont being the exception to that. Yeah, and multifamily has really resurged in Flagstaff as has infill development, um, which has had some growing pains for the community as well, especially when they've impacted existing neighborhoods and um, areas that had been affordable to low and moderate income residents. So that's just some of the characteristics of this growth that we've seen. Um, when we talk about housing, um, right before Christmas, the Monday before Christmas, we will have a, another snapshot on housing and we'll get into some of those market trends. Um, I think it's no mystery that even though we've been adding to the supply, the affordability overall in Flagstaff has been declining. So more to be curious about. Some of our, well, this is a slide we've been putting on a lot of these snapshots. And there's a lot to be curious about when it comes to growth in our community. In fact, that's one of the top things we will be curious about in the next few years um, as we work on the regional plan update. But what does Flagstaff want to grow up to be? Do we want to be exclusive and um, more high income like Aspen? Do we wanna find a way to maintain affordability? Are we, what parts of the community's character will be changing as we see growth happen and how will we make those trade-offs really conscientiously? Um, and then how can growth both reflect our, re our reality of what we can control because we don't control things like macroeconomic trends of financing for housing, and, but we can, make sure our community values continue to be reflected. Um, we also wanna think how change in our community can make it a better community and how those changes can be positive. Um, that we tend to have a lot of focus and a lot of comment on the negative impacts of these changes, um, but they're not always entirely negative. Um, also, how can growth be influenced or prepare for climate change impacts? Um, the city of Flagstaff has adopted a carbon neutrality plan, and there's definitely a question of how will we both grow, because we are growing and we will continue to grow, and how will we achieve simultaneously carbon neutrality? Um, that's a, that is a challenge that many communities all across the United States are rec rec and all across the word world are reckoning with. So um, with that, I'll just ask if there are any questions. Um, we also would like you to fill out our open town hall evaluation webinar, if a webinar evaluation, if you have a moment. Um, this is just a form where you can tell us what you thought of this and how you would like um, to see us improve for the 201 topic or what topics you'd like, you'd want us to be curious about. Those are all things you could fill out on the evaluation. So with that, I'll stop sharing and see if there are any questions. If there are none, we look forward to seeing everyone on uh, December 6th for the next Growth 201 webinar, and I'll stop recording.